Okie dokie, we are now at right at 10.05 by my clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get us going here. Now I wanted to preface by saying that it seems like the best speakers here uh, seem to get the most response whenever they're speaking with the British accent, so my British accent's not very good, so I'm not going to try that one, but follow me, you must. All right, so first of all, who am I? Well, my name is Dave Shields, and I have spent uh, many years in the identity field. Um, it's become sort of a, a passion of mine and something that I've really enjoyed doing. Uh, previously, I was working for the University of Oklahoma in uh, their uh, identity and access management program. I was running it, did a lot of uh, interesting things with identity management, and I actually, in that role, was uh, asked to be the uh, track lead for higher ed content here at Identiverse. So I was very excited. It was a very big honor for me to be able to do that. I am currently serving as the senior uh, security architect for DST Systems, which is a software uh, solutions company in the Kansas City, Missouri area. It's a big transition in my life, but it was something that I felt was a good need. Uh, but I've been about 18 years doing IT security in various shapes or fashion, everything from authentication to uh, uh, being the manager of all those things. And uh, I've pretty much done everything from Indian gaming all the way up to, uh, uh, to running higher ed programs for uh, the universities and things. It's very exciting stuff. And I also have uh, various uh, uh, education and things, but that's kind of the boring stuff. You guys are here to learn about identity and access management engineers and how we get these people to help us. Uh, so I want to give you guys a few facts to get us started about this. Now, if anyone's curious, I'm not going to tell you how to create an AI for identity and access management engineering. That's not quite what we're here for, although that uh, might be the future there. But I'm here to talk to you about an actual identity and access management engineer for your program. If you're here, there's a good chance that you guys are either in a stage where you're beginning or maturing your programs and identity management, you're getting ready to start one. You know there's different people that you need to fill those roles, and sometimes you don't really know what those people are going to be like. So a couple of bits of information about them. Some numbers, and I did these, trying to make these as open as possible. There are around, at least in the areas I checked, well over seven or 8,000 positions in different parts of the country for identity and access management engineering and those things. For instance, here in our uh, host city in Boston, there's almost 1,600 uh, open identity and access management engineering positions. If you go down to the Washington DC area, which was actually kind of surprising to me, of course, I've seen that uh, sort of a lot of jobs that come out of there requesting uh, employment things uh, in the DC, but they're up to about 4,800 and that's uh, or not, not even the latest number. Uh, if you head out to the other coast, and uh, look at that, you're looking at around 3,000 something identity and access management engineering positions in that part of the country. So as you can also see by this awesome chart that I did my best to put and make sense out of, the job growth in this area has gone up rather uh, gradually for the past oh, two years or so, and then from last year to this year, there's been a huge jump in that field. And as you guys kind of saw from the keynote today, that is a perfect example of where we're going. This is a field that is now finally reaching its state where people see it as a viable place, a place where there needs to be workers. And there's a lot of money in this market as well. And if you look at these numbers, most of these are based off of Glassdoor, LinkedIn, a couple of other things, or some of my friends who are willing to share the information with me. The average person here in this area wanting to do identity and access management engineering can ask for a little around 110K per year, plus benefits and all that. Uh, DC, it's a little bit lower, which kind of makes sense, but also kind of doesn't because, you know, it's government and they don't give you as much money, but then there's a whole lot of work there. And then, of course, out there on the West Coast, you can see a um, 130K or so for the salaries in that area, and probably because that is also related to the cost of living and things like that. But either way, you can see that there's some pretty good money to be made. However, there may not be as many professionals that are worried about that money. If you look around this area, there's around 20,000 here in Boston. There are identity and access management professionals based off of uh, LinkedIn and various other sources. If you go up to Washington, D.C., surprisingly, there's almost 26,000 people who say they're identity and access management engineer or some sort of identity and access management role. And then on the West Coast, again, 40,234 professionals. Where, if all these guys are there, why are all these jobs there? That's because it's such a big market. There's so many things you could do with that. But the challenge is finding the right one. These guys are not cheap, as you've seen. If you're with a company who has limited resources for that role, you may have some problems with uh, finding the right person. It's gonna cost you some money. As you guys saw with those numbers, you're looking minimum 100,000 for salaries for most of these particular positions. And that is for finding someone who is new in their field. If you want someone who is a seasoned professional in that field, obviously you're gonna have to be willing to pay more money for that. And yet all of these major metro areas, and I'll have some more numbers here in a minute, they're all looking for these people. So not only do you be, need to be willing to pay them, but they're gonna have several job offers at the same time, or well, at least job uh, interest forms. 
even though I have made myself unavailable as uh, someone for hiring and on my various profiles, I still get two to three messages a day for uh, consulting out in Illinois or going out to help Tesla or something else. And, and it's, 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 if I'm getting that many messages whenever I'm off the market, you can imagine how many people who are on the market are actually getting. And here's some examples though. You also may have a problem finding one near you. Obviously, I know we're all kind of spread out across the country and across the world at this conference, and there's people that uh, have positions uh, all over the place. Of course, we are able to do sort of this open-ended remote market space, so it's not as hard to find someone who's right there. But still, if you look at my previous home con uh, hometown of Oklahoma City, there's about uh, 1,153 professionals in that area, and then 4,772 in the greater Chicago area where we had Identiverse last year so on and so forth. So you can see in all these different areas, I just kind of picked some hot spots, there are a lot of these people in these areas, but if you're not in one of those areas, especially if you're in a not as uh, visible metro or something like that, it may be even more challenging to find someone who's willing to come to you. And a very quick little uh, diagram, I can't really make this perfectly sensible, but you can kind of see spread across the United States some examples of the roles that are out there for identity management, the expectations for uh, those positions as well. Obviously, here on the uh, East Coast where we're at, we have some decent numbers in D.C., but uh, of course, Silicon Valley is kind of blowing everything out of the water out there with all of the jobs plus the professionals. So there's a distributed network of people, but if you're not near one of these hot spots, and granted, not all of them are hot spots, but if you're not near one of these major areas, you may have to find someone to come to you. Another reason that finding the right IM engineer is challenging is because there's a lot of things that are misunderstood about this role. I know this. I cannot tell you the number of times I would be talking to someone about an identity management role. Maybe they were considering hiring me for that role or they were trying to hire someone else and, and uh, they were bringing up these job recs. And I looked at this and said, okay, this is what you want. You go through the questions, you go through the interview and you go, wait a minute, that's not what you wanted at all. So we had to explain this to our, our superiors. So you need to say, first of all, where does this IAM engineer going to fit? Because a lot of people don't know where that is. They look at this and they go, where is this guy going to be? Is he in IT security? Is this guy going to be in operations? Is, he, is each business unit going to have their own identity management team? It's really hard to say. It depends on your organization. But a lot of people just don't know where that fits. Now, if you ask me personally, I'll tell you that there really is no better place for an identity engineer to be than in your IT security team. I think that that is directly connected to the field that you're in and the security that's required. But that's my opinion. Another people might say, well, what does this guy do? What does an IM engineer do? What is their role supposed to include? Well, that also can be a little bit challenging because sometimes you may have people who are focused on developing. These are the guys who can sit down and get a hold of any of these identity platforms and code through things because face it guys, an identity management platform nine times out of 10 is also a development platform. You've got to have people who have that knowledge. Are they going to administer the thing? I know that's something that's come up in my current employer. We have a system there and we say, okay, is the guy who's developing it, is he supposed to be doing the administration of it as well? And they just don't really know where that person's supposed to, or what work they're supposed to be doing. They kind of say, okay, well, he needs to tell people about it, but he needs to make it work. And he, you know, there's all these things that could happen. Another question you might ask yourself is what kind of skills do these guys need? When you look at what an IAM engineer will do, there's a lot of things that could change what they need to do and the skills that you're going to ask of them. They, need to be, they may need to be a software-specific skill set. Maybe they need to be able to use a specific language or specific uh, infrastructure or however it is. There could be many things that you'd have to ask yourself on that. And the question I just mentioned earlier is, does that job description you put out for that role actually meet the need of the person that you're actually trying to hire? So you have to make a choice, okay? Should you hire an IM engineer for your role, looking at some of those positions we saw across the map, some of the professionals that are there, you know what you're up against when you look at that. Another question you should ask is, maybe you should hire a consulting firm. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that decision. There are plenty of amazing consulting firms. I've dealt with many of them here uh, in my time in identity management. You just gotta find the one that fits your organization. That, that may work as well. They could also be more expensive, but they also have a higher skill set that they can pull from as well, so that's useful. But here's the real good question, and the question you guys are all here for is, could you maybe make an existing employee into an IM engineer? And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what we're gonna explore. So if you're going to make the right recipe, everyone knows that you can have a recipe that falls or wins based off of the ingredients you put into it. The fresher the ingredients, the better type ingredients, the better of a product you're most likely going to get as long as you cook it right. So where do you start when you're trying to figure out what those ingredients are? Well, I'm going to luckily give you a quick little litmus test here to help you with that. The first thing you need to ask yourself is what stage of maturity level is your identity management program? This is something that I will 
love getting responses from. When I ask someone, well, what stage are you at? They kind of go, uh, well, we're doing this or that. You have to know how mature your situation is. Is the system just now being built? Then that's still in the infant stages. Maybe it hasn't even been put in yet. Maybe it's something that you guys know needs to happen. Maybe you have this old system or these legacy systems. You got to put it together. And you also have to ask yourself, how far are we going to go with this? Maybe you guys are already three, four, five, six years into your identity management program or more. And that's going to change things a lot. So where you are in that particular maturity level is going to impact greatly where you're going to end up going. Another question to ask, if you haven't created a program yet or you haven't started building that infrastructure, what vendors are you going to use? Because that changes things a lot. There's a lot of uh, big name vendors, even here at this conference, that have very specific uh, products that work for specific things. If you're gonna use one of those particular programs, you guys need to know who, what that's gonna be because it never fails. You hire a person who knows um, SailPoint and then uh, you guys end up selecting Forge Rock and you're going, wait a minute, something, so this guy doesn't quite know how to, how to use those skills. Another question that is very critical to your environment and definitely critical in the higher ed space where I originally came from is are you going to use something that's already there or are you going to make your own? In some organizations, it makes a lot of sense to build your own. In higher education, we built our own stuff for years and that was the way it worked. Unfortunately, that wasn't the best thing when you need to rebuild that program, but in any case, it does happen. But if you're going to hire or if you're going to make a new product and get something off the shelf, you're going to have to pick the person who's going to know how to do that. And another question, and this is probably the hardest one to answer, is how vital does your organization actually see identity management in your organization? Because it's easy to have someone who says that identity management is a top priority, but they may not actually be a top priority when they look at the numbers and what they're trying to do. And what kind of talent does your organization attract? You may attract uh, a very set type of person. Uh, you may have the, uh, the shorts, flip-flop wear, and MacBook person, or you may have the straight-laced corporate person who wants to dress up a certain way, all that. You may have the people who are extremely dedicated to uh, doing new things and trying new stuff and being the risk takers. Maybe that's the kind of organization that you have. Maybe you have an organization that likes safe stuff, that likes things that are risk averse. Whatever the kind of talent that your organization picks will have a very big impact on the type of person you're gonna wanna put in that role. So when you're gauging maturity, it has a strong impact on the person you wanna make as an engineer. Ask yourself first, where am I? Because that's who I need to do to pick. And it's gonna be different depending on the stage you're at. Honesty is still gonna be the best policy. So anytime you're looking at where is my maturity level? What am I doing? How am I gonna get there? Be honest with yourself and be honest with the organization. Are you guys ready for that identity management engineer? Are you ready for that next step? Be honest about it because if you aren't, there's gonna be some challenges there. The vendor that you pick has impacts. We talked about this a little bit, but if the solution's already being implemented or it's already uh, out there, the talent choice can reflect that. Sorry, I'm hitting my mic there. You have to have a person who's gonna have the skills for the technology you're going to use. You also need to ask yourself, where am I going to put this, this product? Is this person gonna be focusing on helping us provision identities from the various sources we have, the SORs or sources of record? Are they going to be, our system going to be focusing on privilege access management? That's something my organization is very interested in. Are, are they going to focus on governance? Is that something that's important? Attestations, who's doing what? Are they supposed to do that? The vendor makes a big impact on that. And another question to ask is where's is the home base of the vendor you pick if you chose that? Because if you look for a product that was made in a certain area, here's a hint. Odds are there's going to be a very specific set of talent from that area. Uh, the best example of this I can think of is the NetIQ product, which is one I use at one of my other organizations, is that was created in the Provo, Utah area. And most of the talent that learned how to do that stuff was in that area. Now, granted, they've sort of spread out over time, but if you don't know where that vendor is from, that may have a hard time finding the person you need. Another question we talked about was rolling your own versus commercial. Did you inherit something that was homebrewed? Anyone else? I did. That was whenever I started my system. Uh, at the university, it was 100% 30-year-old thing that had been living in this dark closet. No one wanted to look at it. It was this monster. If you look at it, you turn to stone. But that doesn't mean that the solution is empty or not going to help you. It just means that it's going to change the way that you look at what you're going to do. And if you have that highly unique environment that's going to be very different, have high, you know, highly cloud-focused or highly uh, uh, remote set of uh, employees, or in my case, we have a group of uh, commercial identities that are in one area, we have our internal identities, we have our customer identities, they, all of those things uh, impact what your identity platform is going to be able to do. And if you're going to use something that is commercial off the shelf, bear in mind that the more you customize that, 
the harder it's going to be to find someone in the future who's going to be able to support that. Leadership support, you got to have that. Just because they say it's top priority doesn't necessarily mean it is by the pocketbook. I learned this the hard way. The product sh or project needs to have some guarantee of the amount of money that the organization is willing to give you to hire the engineers that you need, to hire the firm you need, whatever it is. You need to make sure that's all budgeted and that it's in place. And the longer it takes to get to that stage, then the more challenging it will be to get that leadership support to retain because the longer these things draw out, the harder it is they get to that. And in the end, truth, bottom truth, this is where I would drop the mic if I had one that I could drop, is that it is going to be more expensive than what you originally planned. When you start building an identity management platform, it is going to be at least twice the amount of money you budget for it. I'm just gonna be honest with you. It's a reality, it is where you are, and that, that helps determine what the leadership needs to do. So now about that talent makeup. What kind of people do we attract? We kinda talked about that a little bit. The different kind of people you attract, if you attract people who are high thinkers, who are the geeks that we talked about earlier, those guys are gonna have a very specific skill set that's gonna be great for certain things, but may not be great for a particular identity platform if you aren't ready for it. How large is the team currently? In the organization that I left when I went to the, my, my new organization, we had around oh, five or 10 people in the identity management team, but then we had an organization of you know, 37 to 40,000 people, students, employees, all that, that we had to support. Uh, and the, the IT teams change. Um, in the new organization I'm in now, we have about oh, 10 or 12 people in that, but our customer base is in the millions. So it really just depends on the organization you're in and how that talent is gonna go there. And how dedicated and adaptable are those people? Maybe you have some people already who have done some awesome things, who've been able to make some of these new or old programs work better, and they're hanging out and uh, they're adaptable and they're willing. Those are great people to start talking to. And what I've found definitely in my experience and it's what I've done, it's what you guys will probably have done in your lives as well, is that the best engineers that you find are gonna be the ones who aren't afraid to try stuff. The guys who are gonna say, hey, let me break it. Let me see what happens when I get out of the hood. You know, those are the guys that really know what kind of stuff that you're gonna need to do with this identity platform. So now we get to the critical thing, which is how you make that identity management engineer. So we're gonna talk about that. We're gonna focus now about getting that internal person because to be honest, training someone in your new organization or in an organization to get new to it, to get adapted to everything is challenging. You have to get them up to speed. They have to understand all of the historical things that are out there. They have to get all that and it's just challenging to do. So the best ingredient you need to look for is finding someone who understands how identities get into the organization, where they go, the different things that they have to go through, the hoops they need to jump through, those are what help them. They also need to know what systems are the source of record. The more they know about where the stuff comes from, the better they're gonna be at helping it get to where it needs to go because they know the different streets they have to take, they know the traffic routes there. A logical mind who's able to look at the organization, to look at how provisioning is happening, to look at how identities are coming in, moving out, and can say, okay, I can take this process that you guys are telling me, uh, this organization said we build it this way, I can turn that into a technical solution using our identity platform. And a little bit of creative moxie. Sometimes it's important to have those person, the people who can look at that environment and go, I can make this better, I could do that better. The quality of ingredients is important as well. The ones that are very flexible and able to change direction without warning are gonna be the ones that are gonna save your soul in this because these things change so rapidly you can't even imagine. Having a person who's willing to roll with the changes and who isn't gonna complain because it's not the way it was, those are people who are gonna be great engineers for that. They should not be afraid to ask those questions that no one wants to answer. I cannot tell you the number of times whenever I was leading the identity management program at the university that I would go to someone and say, tell me about this, or how do y'all do that? And I kind of got, mm, meh, mm, because the people don't want to answer those questions. But when you finally answer it, you learn so much more about your identity environment. And this person who you're going to have as an engineer, they must be able to understand the technical makeup of the organization. Are you guys heavy in a particular infrastructure? Are you heavy in a particular type of technology? Are you more cloud focused? Are you more internal? These guys need to understand all of the way that technology is put into play because that's going to impact how you get there. And if possible, they should understand the politics of the organization. That's usually reserved for people who are in your leadership roles, but the fact of the matter is, if that engineer knows that the following four people are going to approve this particular thing, but these five people won't, there's a good chance that you're going to need to try to re-engineer that solution. So the potential candidates could be anyone there that you look at that just has that spark. Maybe you have a sysadmin who is really intelligent, is able to get a hold of these old systems and make them do new things that you never thought they could do. Talk to that person. Maybe you have a developer who was able to take this old interface that was made in Visual Basic 6 and turn it into some web-based API that does amazing things for the organization. Maybe she is the person that you need to talk to in that situation. Do you have a DBA who really gets the data inside your organization and knows how that stuff moves around? Talk to that person. 
Ask them if they'll be willing to help you with this identity stuff. However, there are some things that simply cannot be taught. You cannot teach logic, you cannot teach creativity, you cannot teach flexibility. Those are things that you must have already part of your person, they can't be taught. They can be enforced, but that's really not where you want to be. You cannot train someone to motivate themselves to do this hard work. Identity management is tough. The deeper into the pit you get, the harder it's going to be. They've got to be willing to do impossible things. And you can't teach someone to change it if they don't think it's broken. If you talk to a person in the organization who says, ah, we don't need to make our identities different, it works just fine. Don't talk to that person. That's not the person you need. So the focus in all this is select the right person with the right drive. Select the best mix of engineering knowledge and a little bit of creative, a little bit of ability to do those challenges. Technology can be taught, flexibility, creativity cannot. So I ran through that really quickly. I'm going to give you guys a little bit of chance to ask some questions if you have. Um, here's some contact information for me. There's an email address right there you can reach me at. I usually uh, choose it because we have a lot of filters at my new company with email. Also, you can find me on LinkedIn. I post uh, various uh, things about identity management, m sort of my musings and uh, as I see it. Just a few minutes left. Uh, questions? Anyone want to ask questions? Very good question. So if in case y'all didn't hear, he said, what about uh, the degree level that someone needs to be in this role? Do you want a person who's got their, their certain degree or do you want someone who has that experience? I think that again depends a lot on the organization, but obviously uh, if you have someone who's at least got a uh, you know, bachelor's of some sort in the uh, IT field, that's going to help them because they're going to understand the technologies that are you know, around there. They're going to understand how those sort of interplay with each other. But really it's the person who knows more about the way the organization functions and knows about the technologies in that organization. Uh, I know the person that we hired for the IM engineer uh, at my uh, university role and actually it's kind of the person I based this off of. Uh, was someone who just had a very basic bachelor's, but he'd been at the company for a very long time, and he was not afraid to do weird stuff. He was able to look at this situation, and I, I explained to him what identity management would do, and uh, within a few seconds, he and I are uh, on a napkin, and he's drawing me processes that he could think through about how that could work, and I'm like, you're the guy. That's the person you want. So it really just depends on the kind of, the kind of knowledge you need. I would say the person who knows your organization best and the technologies they use. Oh, yes. Uh, hiring people straight out of university. I think that that depends on the innovation that you want. Uh, obviously, the fresh out of the, uh, of the university are going to be people who are going to be game changers. They want to do things differently. But if the organization wants to support those people and they're not going to back them up, they're going to they're going to wilt pretty quickly. So if you can hire someone who is is willing to fit that organization and is is not afraid to try that, but is also uh, willing to change and and be willing to deal with the old bureaucratic nature if it happens in your organization, that would be an option I would look at. Right, so you're basically asking, should you make the team more of like one or two people or have people who specialize in particular areas that are part of that, that platform? I agree with the second version. I think it's a good idea to have a team that specializes in certain areas. Uh, at the university, it was very much me and a couple of other people that were only in the identity space. Now, we interacted with other teams and things like that. But then when it came down to it, we had to re-explain to those organizations and those people who were, bring, who were helping us how we needed something to work. Whereas if we actually had a team dedicated to those particular technologies and that, that we could say, this is the developer. So uh, business, uh, HR brought this to us. The developer was able to take that and code it into uh, a business process. We put it in identity management. It worked great. So I think that that is the way I would focus. Have a team with people who specialize in the development of the technology, the people who are able to engineer the environment, make the systems uh, work together, build it from scratch, but also the people who can keep it running, care and feeding. You may have an organization that's DevOps where you can build something up and you can spit it out and uh, give a dev team or ops team the ability to hold on to it. That's great as well if you can keep that running, but your identity management team still needs to be part of that process. Good question. Other questions? Oh, back in the back.
Right. I, I see what you're saying. Is the question basically was, do you really want one IM engineer who's not only uh, the one who's doing the work, but also out there telling people about it? I believe that it's actually not a good idea to do that. Not anything against the engineers, but it just like you said, there are people whose brains are great at being in the basement and they're doing their thing. Uh, for instance, the engineer that we hired for the university, uh, he was uh, the internal hire. That guy is a brilliant guy and ex you know, I mean, intelligent as all get out. Do not put him in front of a crowd because he just doesn't do that. That's not his scene. That's not how he works. And that's why they had someone like me who was not afraid to step up in front of the leadership and go, here's what we need to do. Someone who plays the part of that sort of evangelist, the person who's not afraid to go up in front of people and say, here's what we got to do. Here's the best way to accomplish it. I think that is the kind of person that you need there. So I would say having some the engineers doing it, but also having that sort of director role or someone above that that can see the political, see all the pieces together and be able to take what the engineers are saying and provide it out to that organization. I think we're out of time, uh, based on what I'm seeing here, about a minute or so over. However, I'm going to hang out here for just a few minutes if anyone needs to ask me questions uh, or feel free to send me information via LinkedIn. Appreciate you guys coming.